Our next speaker is Benson Nene, a professor of philosophy and co-director of the Center for Philosophical Psychology at the University of Antwerp and senior research associate at Petras Cambridge University. So far, this, this conference is really great, and uh, yeah, both the philosophy and the psychology and neuroscience. And what I'm trying to do here is to come somewhere in between. So, um, Mark Kalein, the provocative one, maybe, for a conference on imagination. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as imagination in some sense. And for the Turkish uh, audience members, I'm going to translate this place to Turkish. <laughs> Correct, isn't it? Okay, so uh, so although the claim that there's no such thing as imagination that might might sound provocative, but I don't think it is a very provocative claim. Really, what I'm trying to say is that mental imagery is a thing. A supposition is a thing. Imagination is not a thing. It's just a kind of a mix between those two. Um, so, and by the thing, I mean, by the natural kind. So, I, so I, um, I think that mental imagery is a really important kind of that thing, that, this, that term, that picks out a really important mental phenomenon as the supposition. And I think that imagination is really what it picks out. It's just a kind of mix, mix, mix of it. But this claim, the, you know, how, how convincing that claim is going to be very much is going to depend on the concept of mental imagery. So I, I will make an extra claim here, and this is kind of, that's what I really care about, the most recent paper I have a deadline for, so I have to really think about it hard. Uh, namely, that mental imagery doesn't have to be conscious. So this claim is going to be much more convincing if you're going with a conception of mental imagery whereby mental imagery can be unconscious. And, and, uh, and I want to give you reasons to think that mental imagery can be unconscious. So this is, the, this is what I want to do. So uh, the, third, the, the first bit of the paper is also kind of independently important for me. Somehow that, uh, just to convince you that actually imagination, that by saying that it's not a natural kind, it doesn't mean that we should not take it seriously, that it's not a, doesn't play an extremely important role in our life. I don't argue that it plays an extremely important life, role in my life. And that's also kind of a step. So really, this paper kind of embeds two separate papers. One of them is about how Imagination is really important for us and for the self and for who we are. And uh, and then I want to talk about mental imagery and what that is, and then I want to argue that it can be unconscious, and then I want to put this together and argue that imagination is really just supposition plus <coughs> mental imagery, whereby the mental imagery can be often unconscious. So the first thing I want to do, ironically, given that the ultimate aim is to, to argue that imagination doesn't exist in the sense that it's not a, a proprietary thing, it's just a mix between two things, is that imagination is an extremely important thing. So, um, and I want to give you two reasons, and especially for, for the set. And, the, and I want to give you a pretty strong claim here, namely that uh, the self, who you are, um, depends on imagination in two senses, in two ways. It depends on it synchronically and diachronically. So it depends on it kind of, um, yeah. So the first one, the first I want to talk about is synchronic reason and then diachronic reason. So the syn for the synchronic reason, I'm taking my lead from the Portuguese uh, writer and poet, uh, Pessoa, who says this, uh, because I'm nothing, I can imagine myself to be anything. If I were somebody, I wouldn't be able to. An assistant bookkeeper, and for the record, he was an assistant bookkeeper, uh, who did some writing inside, can imagine himself to be a Roman emperor. The king of England can do that, because the king of England has lost the ability in his dreams to be any other king than the one he is. His reality limits what they feel, is what he can feel. So, so I, think, I think this is a really important and revealing quote about just uh, how who you are and how you think of yourself limits what you're imagining about yourself and what you're imagining about yourself. 
and constitute the limits about who you, who you think you are. And, and one of the reasons for that, or maybe the main the, the important reasons for that, has to do with desires. So, um, what is a self, you might ask? And, you know, I wish I knew, but uh, what, and there's lots of things, lots of mental states that are included in yourself. But one thing that's definitely included is your desires. So if your desires are completely different, then you would have a completely different self. There might be other things, you know, your beliefs, your emotions, your moods, your preferences. But desires, definitely. But here's the thing, desires do, do depend on imagination. You couldn't have a desire for sutlaj if you, uh, if, you, if you had no ability to imagine yourself eating um, and, and I, should, I should say that this is a different connection that I'm trying to make between desire and imagination than, than the one that people have been making about desires and mental imagery. So there's a thriving research program in the psychology of desire, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, elaborated thought theory of desire that, uh, that makes heavy use of mental imagery, and I think it's a really important program, and I have not, no critical remarks about this. It's just that I'm, I'm talking about the different connection here between imagination and desire, and, and it's, a, it's a really tight um, connection. So, if you had different imaginative abilities, then you would have different desires. The desires that you have, that constitutes, and it's not just about, not just for but about, you know, wanting to grow up to be a great uh, researcher or whatever, uh, those depend on, how, on you imagining yourself, right? imagining that outcome. You couldn't have a desire for P if you couldn't imagine P. So in that sense, your desires are constituted by your imagination. And then given that desires constitute yourself, that means that imagination constitutes yourself. So this is the synchronic reason, because it's, you know, your <coughs> imagination now constitutes yourself now. And I think that's a pretty strong reason already, uh, but there's another reason, and that's a diachronic reason, so that has to do with, with something about how what your imagination now fixes or can constitutes yourself in the future. And that has to do with decision making. So here is, uh, you know, we make a lot of decisions. We make small decisions like, you know, where to go to eat, and those we often make uh, in a way that uh, we have some kind of stable preferences or we have some desired beliefs about what, what's a better place than another place. But that's not going to be the case for like, this really grown decision in our life that, you know, should I get married? Should I get divorced? Should I take this job or that job? Should I move to a different country? And so on. So I think those decisions we actually make with the help of imagination. So here's the, uh, yeah, the, the example that I've been using. Might be boring for some of you guys. So, uh, so you're making a, a choice. You're on the job market and you get two job offers. One is in an uh, exciting big city in a terrible philosophy department. And the other one is in an excellent philosophy department with great students, fantastic colleagues, but it's in a boring small college town. So how are you going to decide? And I would say that you don't decide by having belief, comparing your desire, satisfaction, conditions, given your background beliefs. What you do is that you're imagining yourself in one situation, and you're imagining yourself in another situation, and you're going to go with the one that feels better. So this is kind of the, um, the first glance at this decision-making exercise. So have, how many of you have made decisions like this before? Okay, great. Um, so, so, so what you're doing there is that you're imagining yourself in a certain situation. In situation one, small, boring college town, great university. And in situation two, great, vibrant city, terrible philosophy department. And then you compare them. But it's not really the case. You're not really in a position to just imagine yourself in that situation because you're lacking a lot of crucial information from that situation. So when I imagine myself in uh, um, in the boring college town in the great philosophy department, there's, there's some things that I know about that. I mean, presumably, I have visited the campus. I know some things, but there's certain things that I don't know about. Certain things like who I'm going to hang out with, or which colleagues I'm going to be social. Those things I only imagine. And the same thing with the vibrant city. So it's not really the case that you're just imagining yourself in a scenario. It's you're imagining yourself in an imagined scenario. So there's already two spots where imagination plays a role. And there's a third one. Because you, 
if you're imagining yourself, as in your present self, your current self, in these future scenarios, that's just completely irrelevant, because your current self is not going to be there. It's your future self that's going to be there, who might be very different, as we've seen yesterday, for those of you who have been here, um, with the end of history illusion and all that stuff. So really, what you have to, in, in, in order for this decision to even make sense, what you would have to do is to imagine, not your current self, not your present self, but your imagined self in these imagined scenarios. So there's three uses of imagination. Okay, so I, and I want to focus on the last one, so kind of that you're imagining your, your imagined self in these future scenarios. What is this imagined? And I want to, and, and here's the kind of the crucial twist here, namely that uh, who your future self is going to be will depend on the decision that you're making now. So that's one of the reasons why this, why all of this imagination-based decision making is just completely unreliable. I'm not sure what reliability means here, but just completely off, because you're imagining your future self, what you imagine to be your future self in these future scenarios. But who, what, what's going to be your future self? is determined by the decision that you're making now. If I'm going to move to the small college town, then I'm going to become a very different person. I'm going to work a and I'm going to be into gardening, and I don't know, uh, um, I don't know, like, uh, you know driving a <coughs> pickup truck and stuff. So, whereas if I move to the, to the big city, then I'm going to be a you know, uh, so, um, so, so, it's, so who my future self is going to be depends on my current decision. And remember that the current decision heavily, as in extremely heavily, relies on imagination in a threefold way. So, again, just to put together the argument, your, what's going to determine who your future self is going to be depends on the decisions that you're making now, and these decisions are very much relying on your imagination. So your future self relies on your imagination at the moment. So that's the diachronic. The, uh, the kind of relation, the diachronic, uh, this diachronic sense in which imagination is future, is future is stuff. All right, so, uh, so, so this is, so I hope I convinced you that imagination is very important. Uh, and now I'm going to try to kind of bring it down a peg. So uh, what I want to say is just because this is a very important thing uh, for our life in general and for ourselves and all that, that doesn't imply that it's a mental natural kind. There's lots of things that are important for us that are not like mental natural kinds. Um, so, uh, and then, and then, so, so again, the, the option I want to go with is that it's a hybrid of two different mental states, so between mental imagery and, and supposition. So here are some, uh, some options that people have been trying out in terms of the, to, uh, to understand the relation between imagination and mental imagery. So one view is that mental imagery is just straight necessary for imagination. So if you don't have imagination, if you don't have mental imagery, there's various ways of doing this. So you can just say that, well, imagination equals supposition plus mental imagery. Or you can say that imagination is just one way of exercising mental imagery. It might actually be somewhat similar. You can also, have that, you can also say that, well, it's not, well, it might not be like strictly necessary for imagination. But Using mental imagery is one way in which you can fill in the detail of what is imagined. Maybe not the only way. Maybe there are other ways. Um, so one way of making this uh, this issue more urgent is to go back to the distinction between imagination and supposition that Margot talked about extensively in the morning. So I know I can be I can speed up a little bit here. So one kind of classic way of, uh, of making this distinction between supposition and imagination is that imagination involves mental imagery, supposition is an, uh, it's one way you can also do it in other ways. So maybe supposition is accompanied by some kind of other thing, so that uh, I don't want to say uh, a lot about this, but just to, just to emphasize that this is an important distinction, and why is it an important distinction? Because of all the stuff that I just said in the first half of the talk, uh, so imagination, again, is constituted to the self, both synchronically and, and diachronically. I don't think supposition is. I don't think you know, what we're supposing for for uh, would be uh, particularly important. So in this case, you know, supposition might be a natural kind, natural natural kind might be the same, but it just doesn't play as super important in our life. And there's other reason is also something that Margaret mentioned, and that's in the imaginative resistance. I'm gonna skip that. 
So, so the upshot is that imagination is really special, but not so much. Not so much. And there's various ways in which they uh, they differ. And here's one that people have not really been uh, been focusing on that much, but that uh, that is a kind of a, as good a starting point as any. And that's the uh, that's just uh, how thick they are temporal. So supposition doesn't take time at all. You just suppose that p, you just did. Whereas if you imagine that p, then arguably what's happening is that it takes some time. It takes some time to fill in the details or drawing the consequences or doing something with this uh, with the thing that you're imagining. So it, so one of them is just a momentary thing, the supposition. The imagination is more it has more of a temporal thickness. And this is uh, where you could say that natural imagery is going to play a role. Because the way in which these, the, these details are going to be filled in when the consequences are generally drawn is by means of natural imagery. But again, so this is a not particularly new suggestion that uh, mental imagery is necessary for, uh, for imagination. Um, but what I want to say is that the strength of this claim, or kind of how convincing you're going to find this claim, is going to very much depend on what you mean by mental imagery. And, uh, Here's what I mean by mental imagery. So this is um, the two quotes that are so that I'm, I'm taking from the from the psychologists, and I think it's representative of how the term is used in uh, in psychology and neuroscience. And the way I kind of uh, sum it up is that mental imagery is perceptual processing that is not triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation in the sense of that. So you have. And by perceptual processing, I mean early perceptual processing. So if you want to go um, brain areas, uh, it, it's going to be the prime visual cortex, maybe F, F, V4, V2, V4, MT, uh, those, maybe, maybe more. I don't want, I don't, I'm not really interested in drawing the line between perceptual and perceptual. Area. But if there's something, some kind of activation trigger in the prime visual cortex, that is not triggered by the retina, that's going to be mental imagery. So, so, right, so I, I, I think that this is the way people in psychology and neuroscience are thinking about mental imagery, at least many of them. I don't think this is the way philosophers talk about mental imagery. I think the way philosophers talk about mental imagery is, is by, uh, I think I don't know, my, my kind of zinger there, that, uh, what philosophers are doing is that it's true for me, so it must be true for everyone else. <laughs> so, um, so they close their eyes and visualize an apple, that's the idea, and then whatever comes out that's mental imagery. And I want to relate these two conceptions to, uh, to one another. So I think that, uh, that closing your eyes and, and visualizing an apple, can you just do that for me? Closing your eyes and visualizing an apple? Got it? Except for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you what you see there, what, what the kind of thing, the kind of mental state that you have is mental imagery, but it's an atypical mental imagery in a number of ways. One way in which it's atypical is that it's visual, whereas mental imagery can be auditory, olfactory, tactile, and so on. Another way in which it's atypical is that it's uh, a voluntary mental imagery, you count to three and then visualize, whereas mental imagery is very involuntary. So for example, when you um, when, when you have these unpleasant flashbacks of some kind of scene that you've seen, or, or earworms with the auditory sense of everything. I'm going to skip the century, but it's a bit, and, and it, all, it can also, it's also aided in the sense that it's conscious mental imagery. And I want to say, I'm going to spend some time on this later, that mental imagery can be unconscious. So, in some sense, I'm using a, uh, a wider and more inclusive concept of mental imagery that I'm borrowing from uh, psychology and neuroscience. And the philosophical conception is a subcategory of that. But I think it's, uh, it has theoretical virtues to use the more the broader account. So if you use the broader account, then there's a bunch of things that are going to count as mental imagery. Even. For example, the neospreading illusion. So I'm not sure how visible that is, but you can. Uh, can you see these little lines here? The diagonal line? Can you? Yeah. Cool. So that's, uh, that's Early, so we have a lot of imaging data that shows that it's uh, early cortical processing. It is actually a visual cortex that happened. That is clearly not triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation in the given system. Because there is no sensory stimulation in the given system. Okay. This is just more drawn wide. So that's by definition mental imagery. 
Immune completion is going to count as uh, mental imagery again. Well, this is immune completion. I'm happy to talk about the distinction. Uh, again, how many of you see, so you see this kind of line here? Even you, obviously. Uh, and, and that's again, we know that it happens in the primary visual cortex and it's clearly not triggered by uh, sensory stimulation here because there is no sensory stimulation there. So that's again. Early perceptual processing that's not triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation as well as sense modality, so that might count as mental imagery. So one important, dis another distinction between different kinds of mental imagery that I haven't mentioned, so I mentioned a couple of them, uh, different sense modalities, um, voluntary, involuntary, conscious, unconscious. Another one is, about, is between top-down and bottom-up mental imagery. Sorry, and, and that's true for, um, that's a good way to kind of start. Uh, understanding the distinction is in angular completion, so the way you are going to fill in complete this contour is like that, not like this. Um, and the reasons for that seem to be fully bottom up. It's just uh, it's following very simple Gestalt rules. The same here, how many of you see one long horse? How many of you see two horses in the front of this horse and the back of this horse? Some, yeah, it's always some. Uh, but very often you just see one long horse, although you know that that's not what you're supposed to do. That's not, that's not the way smart horses are. It's not you know, sausage horses. And you can also you know it's surrounded by normal horses. So you've seen it, and in some sense, you know, you, this is not what you're supposed to do. But you can't help it. So that's again, it's kind of a typical mark of plus markers. Now, uh, but mental imagery can be top down, so can immobile completion. So for those of you not seen me giving a version of this talk, so I haven't seen this picture. How, what, can you see something in this picture? Well, it's a good thing too, because the, the people who are making this, uh, they, they worked a lot so that you couldn't recognize anything. But this is what's in the picture. And here it is again. You see it's very different, right? It's a big, huge, uh, phenomenal difference. Now, what I'm, uh, I mean, then it's a nice way of demonstrating you know, top down influence on perception. But it's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is, uh, is because what's happening, again, in early cortical areas, especially in prime visual cortex, uh, the direction sensitive neurons that are corresponding to, uh, thing before, uh, right, to the nose, they are in the, in the before phase, they're silent, they don't do anything, they, are, they have no reason to do anything. But in the after phase, they're firing very quickly. So, again, that's uh, that the, this early processing that is not triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation, and again, it's not triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation because there is no corresponding sensory stimulation, that is top down influence in this case. Just how top down was the top? That's a different question, but it's top down influence. And you can also, uh, there's also a multimodal mental imagery. So, how many of you actually kind of hear Obama's distinctive voice here? Um, so this is a, uh, oh, this really takes me back. <laughs> anyway, um, so what's happening here is that you have early auditory, you, you, in, in the case of many of you actually have auditory, some kind of auditory experience, some kind of conscious auditory mental imagery that is clearly not triggered by the auditory sensibility because you don't hear anything or that doesn't know about your mind distinctive tone of voice, not Obama's distinctive tone of voice, when you're looking at this. So it's not triggered by corresponding auditory stimulation. What, what it's triggered by, is triggered by visual sensory stimulation. So what's happening is that sensory stimulation in one sense modality triggers early cortical activity in a different sense modality. So that's going to count as mental imagery, and I call it now multiple mental imagery. Uh, and even if you don't hear the Obama's distinctive tone of voice, um, your auditory cortices are nonetheless very much uh, activated, even if I showed this to you in, in complete silence. So again, it doesn't really, you know, even if you're not conscious of it. So again, that's going to count as mental image, it's going to count as mental image. Um, Alright, done this one. Alright, so you might worry, is this really mental imagery? That's not what I, what I think of. Mental imagery, that's not the way I think of it. So here's the thing, I, don't, I think mental imagery is a, like a natural language concept. I don't think that we can do ordinary language analysis. In fact, I have a hypothesis that I'm going to run by you now. I don't think that the, the term, the exact term mental imagery exists in any other languages other than English. Does it, does it exist in Turkish? That would be different from kind of an image. 
but it's also different from imagining something. Well, uh, we can talk about it later, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a kind of a, 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 a sui generis term for that. So it's a technical term. So you mean by it what, uh, so you can't really, there's no kind of right or wrong meaning of it because it's a technical term. We should, we should give, give it a meaning that does the most theoretical uh, work for us. And, and I think we're trying to argue that, that if, we, if we kind of extend, expand the scope of mental imagery from the kind of more philosophical conception of conscious, voluntary, often visual mental imagery to this more inclusive concept, then that's going to actually do some kind of the work. But also this kind of, you know, if you're, if you're doing philosophy of the kind that I like to do, that if someone has some kind of links with the empirical sciences, then we better use concept that we can communicate, with, that we can use to communicate with, uh, with the empirical sciences. And given that they are not so interested in, you know, what's going on, what's in one train, that's a, that would be a good idea. But again, I'm not interested in kind of ordinary language analysis of the concept of mental Im imagery because I don't think it's an ordinary language concept. So if you really have a very strong intuition about what mental imagery is, you can just call this mental imagery stock. Again, the reason why I'm giving this talk is to understand something about the, the relation between imagination and mental imagery and how mental imagery might be necessary for imagination. Well, if you don't like that claim, then I'm going to say that mental imagery is star. Uh, and there's a bunch of findings that you can look at if you want to. So here's the very simple picture. You have some early cortical activation. That can be triggered by a number of things. If it's triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation, so let's, let's suppose that you have early cortical activation in the visual cortex, in B1. That can be triggered by a number of things. It could be triggered by corresponding sensory stimulation in the visual sense modality, so retinal input. In that case, you have sensory stimulation during perception. If it's triggered by anything else, then you get mental imagery. If it's triggered by sensory stimulation in a different sense modality, this should not be the mental um, Then it's multimodal mental imagery. All right. So now, now we're coming to the, the real meat of the talk, I guess, when I'm trying to convince you that mental imagery can be unconscious. And again, the philosophical conception, I think, partly because of this great methodology that some philosophers use that they just introspect and then they think of it's true for everyone else. Um, is that mental imagery is somehow necessarily conscious. And I want to convince you that that's not the case. I think that mental imagery can be conscious, it can also be unconscious. So I'm going to, I want to give you three different reasons, a methodological one, a conceptual one, and an empirical one. And I want to actually start with a conceptual reason. So again, mental imagery is perceptual processing of a certain kind that's triggered or not triggered by certain things. We know for a vast amount of the empirical findings that perception can be conscious or unconscious. So perception that's triggered, you know, that's a visual perception that's triggered by visual input, that can be conscious or unconscious. It would be extremely surprising when that, that, visual, that visual perception that's triggered by something else, let's say auditory input, would not, would, would not have the, the potential or potentiality to be unconscious. So, is this clear? So if perception can be unconscious and unconscious, then mental imagery, which is really just perceptual processing of a slightly different kind, in the sense that it's triggered by something else, the actual perceptual processing is not that different, then that can also be conscious and unconscious. Now that there's a methodological reason, and that is to say that all the experiments that we have from the... So, all right, so that kind of goes back to the, to the point that I made on, on the previous slide, that if you want to somehow communicate to psychologists and to neuroscientists, then we should be able to we should be able to use the same kind of terminology. And the terminology they're using, or rather the concept of the imagery that is presupposed by all these all the findings that they have, all these actual experimental setup, is not something that makes the assumption that mental imagery has to be conscious. So let's take the the most famous mental imagery experiment, the mental rotation task. So the mental rotation task. When you do the mental rotation, the men, how many of you know the mental rotation task? So, so you, you get these two three-dimensional figures and you have to say which one, uh, whether they, you know, they, they are just a kind of rotation of each other or not. And, and there's you know, lots of cool findings about that. But at no point does the subject need to somehow rely on conscious imagery. And at no point 
is the consciousness of the imagery is utilized. It's a reaction time experiment, right? You have to do the rotation and then you have to push, push the button. You don't have, I mean, you don't, there's no assumptions about whether you're conscious or not. So there's not, uh, and, that's, and, and I could walk you through all the other uh, mental imagery experiments as well. So whatever concept is used in these experiments, that's not the concept of mental imagery that's necessarily conscious. It might be conscious, it might not be conscious. And now that comes to the empirical reason, and that uh, that's very nicely set up by Adam's talk, uh, because uh, here I want to rely on, on many of the aphantasia findings. So first I pronounced it as aphantasia, and then I heard lots of people pronounce it as aphantasia, so I went to that way, so, that's time. so now I have to go back, because Adam coined the terms as aphantasia, so I don't have a choice. So one, uh, the one thing, I, the first thing I want to say about the aphantasia thing is that, that, and that was clear from Adam's talk as well, is that clearly it can be. That's not a monolithic phenomenon. It's uh, the lack. It's the lack. It's again. It's a behavioral marker that people uh, are not able to conjure up mental images. I don't think that's going to be a monolithic explanation for that. There's lots of things can, that can go wrong. Some of it is uh, prefrontal. So it has, that has to do with the voluntary conjuring up of the images. And uh, my hypothesis, Lucas, is that you have that. Mm -hmm. You have the problem with the voluntary conjuring up. Yeah, well. yeah. But there can be also problems with, uh, with the actual image generation. So, uh, so with the, with the visual, visual, visual case. So my hypothesis is that uh, at least some of the aphantasia, aphantasia patients, uh, they, uh, they do have mental imagery in the sense that I'm using the term. They do have early cortical activation that's not treated by corresponding sensory stimulation. They do have sense validity, but it's unconscious. So they have mental imagery, but they have unconscious mental imagery. I'm not saying that all of them do. I think that some of them do. And there's some uh, empirical reasons to think that. So there's a, um, a study that was actually published in the special issue of the journal Cortex that Adam edited on aphantasia uh, that was actually that he was showing here a little bit um, that uh, I also have a paper in and, and, lots of, and also Pearson, the Pearson lab who we who, who also mentioned. So here is the, uh, so this is the very tentative finding with the n is one, that's just one subject, one aphantasia subject and the, and the task is this. You say that you have to visualize a diamond. So it, this is, it, here it's actually two tasks that I, uh, that I explained. One of them is a working memory task, and the other one is an imagery task. So the working memory task, is, which is easier to explain, is this. You, first you're shown the word diamond, and then you know, and then, the, and then you are shown the actual diamond there. And then they mask that stimulus, and then they show you a dot, and then you have to say uh, whether that dot was inside the diamond or outside the diamond, and then you have to raise it. So this is a working memory task. And apparently a fantasia, that a fantasia patient did very badly on that. And there's the imagery task, and it's this exact same thing except for the second, the second step, where they don't show you the diamond, you just have to visualize the diamond. So again, it says diamond, you visualize the diamond, and there's of course a sort of triangle so it's inside that bracket, and they mask it, and then you have to say whether that dot is inside or outside. And here, there's no difference between the performance of, uh, of this subject and uh, and controls, and not, not, not aphantasia control. So that's, that suggests that there's at least a kind of a behavioral similarity between the, between the subjects, between the aphantasia subjects and, not, and the, and the uh, non aphantasia subjects, in which case it just doesn't really make that much sense to describe these people as lacking mental imagery, that given that this mental imagery drive driven task, they are not. Uh, they're not performing differently from, um, from controls. What would, be a what would give us a much stronger reason to think, um, to think this is if we did some proper scanning of the early visual cortices of aphantasia patients, but no one is willing to do that with <laughs> me. So I've been talking to the people in Argos, they do stuff like that in Leuven, uh, done in Australia, in uh, Sydney. And, uh, and, and it, 
that would be a kind of a make it or break it experiment about whether that's true that at least some ape enthusiast objects they do have mental imagery in the sense that they have early cortical activation that's not treated by corresponding sensory stimulation, but an unconscious one, or just their, their sensory uh, cortices are just completely silent when they're visualizing. Um, so again, my suspicion would be is that some of them, for some of them, yes, for some of them, no. But it's enough for them if there's some of them that are. Uh, that when they, some, some aphantageous subjects, when they are uh, visualizing, then their, whatever happens in their paravisual cortices is indistinguishable from, from what happens in, uh, in alpha subjects, because that already would show us that there's uh, an unconscious mental imagery there. And you know, there's fairly simple protocols about this, for example, how uh, in, in, uh, in non aphantageous subjects, in the primary visual cortex, you have the natural sensitive neurons are firing here. And it would be very easy to see whether that's also the case in uh, aphantageous. Oh, objection. There's another finding. There's not a lot of uh, published um, findings about aphantasia yet, but we're going to change them. But uh, one, one really interesting and exciting finding is, uh, is coming from the, the Pearson lab. And by the way, Pearson is fully on board with uh, my general claim about unconscious uh, mental imagery. So that's a good thing. On the other hand, it's not a good thing that his experiments seem to suggest otherwise. So, uh, so, the, so, uh, so Adam mentioned the general uh, protocol that, that they have. So they use binocular rivalry. So binocular rivalry is. Uh, this phenomenon that when you present it to different stimuli, to different uh, eyes, then there's this kind of some of them are sometimes some of them is dominant, some of them is not. If you've seen, if you're primed with a certain kind of stimulus, and they use this kind of green vertical versus red horizontal, if you're primed perceptually, visually, with the, just the color red or something like that, then that's gonna uh, that's gonna make it more likely that your binocular rivalry is gonna be resolved in the red, in the vertical red direction. And the big finding that they had that they were very happy about is that the same thing happens even if you're imagining it. Uh, that's for normal. So that's for non aphantageous subjects. But, um, but they, so they also did this experiment with, uh, with a number of aphantasia people, and they seem to have uh, shown no primary effect. So they, when they were, they were imagining red, the red vertical lines, they did not have any effect. On the binocular rivalry. So that seems to suggest that, well, at least for this aphid, there's, there's a kind of a real and tangible behavior, behavioral difference in terms of their, what their mental imagery does. So I think that's right. On the other hand, what's happening here is that whatever is doing the work here for the non aphantageous subject, when we can prime them with a, with a vertical red so that their binocular rivalry is going to uh, resolve in that way, is Whatever is doing the work there is the conscious mental imagery, right? It's it's the what what is influenced by this conscious mental imagery is the conscious first half of the binocular library. So I'm not denying that there's a difference between conscious mental imagery and unconscious mental imagery. I'm just saying that there is such a thing as unconscious mental imagery. But uh, there's certain things that you can do with conscious mental imagery that you can't do with unconscious mental imagery. And that's so this experiment I think is about conscious mental imagery. And I will be happy to grant that uh, in fact, it follows from what I'm saying that aphantasia people, they, they, their conscious mental imagery is very different from non aphantasia patients' conscious mental imagery. Oh, that's good. All right, and uh, just to kind of bring it back to, the, to where we started, so the general idea is that uh, when we're imagining something, we fill in the details of the, the proposition that we imagine. And we do that with the help of mental imagery. And very often, this is supposed to be an equal or equal sign, sorry. Um, and we very often do that with, with the help of unconscious mental imagery. So you're not going to be aware of the mental imagery that you use to at the thing. So very often, like the, the main objection that you get for the claim that, oh, imagination is just supposition plus mental imagery, that people are saying, well, you know, I, I imagine stuff. I never use mental imagery. So fine, but you're not in a position to actually tell. Because it's not if, if because if you're using mental imagery, that might not be conscious mental imagery, it might be unconscious mental imagery, in which case you have no idea that mental imagery is that. Again, uh, the only way to tell is if you're 
stick people in this together. Um, good. So, uh, and I should make one more, one last uh, clarifying remark that what I was arguing for is that mental imagery can be unconscious, that can be conscious or unconscious. I didn't say anything about that imagination can be conscious or unconscious. I actually think that imagination is a conscious woman to react. Uh, but the content of the imagined episode can be influenced or, or kind of modified by the unconscious mental imagery. So mental imagery can be conscious or unconscious, but imagination, I think, is necessarily conscious. Thank you very much. Now Lucas Thorpe from Bosch University Philosophy Department will comment. So my, my, my graduate students made me promise that I'd start the talk by making by saying Ben Jane and I and then just pausing. So I've done that for them. So now I can start talking about my comments. I haven't got a PowerPoint, I've just got a Word document. Let's open it. So um, my comments about Benjamin's work is going to be based on Ben says work is going to be based upon the slides, um, but also an article he wrote that I, just, I show, show at the end from 2018. In his slide, we have a quote from Coslin: "Visual mental imagery is seeing in the absence of the appropriate immediate sensory input." And in his paper, Ben say, says defining mental imagery. He wants to define mental imagery as perceptual processing not triggered by a corresponding sensory simulation. So I take it, when, a, when someone says something like mental imagery is blah, 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 we have to think about what they're doing. So one thing we could be doing is we could be making a substantial identity statement, like water is H2O. This could be an empirical finding. In this case, one thing we could be doing is we could be doing some sort of phenomenology. We could be basing our claims on something like introspection, or what we could be doing is we could be providing some sort of definition. And when it comes to providing a definition, we, it could be based on our common sense, everyday understanding of the term. We're doing the philosophy of English, in some sense, how English works. We could be appealing to how specialists, how the scientists are using this term. Or we could be introducing a stipulative definition. We could just be saying, this is how I'm going to use the term. I'm just telling you my use of language. And I take it, um, Amy Kind, at least in her 2001 paper, is talking about imagination, but I think she's, she's doing something that involves 2 and 3A, analysis of language, appealing to introspection. And I think that the sort of stuff Adam Saman is doing is best thought of as something a bit like 1, where we are, um, in some sense, trying to come up with a substantive identity statement. And I think that what Bente is doing is best thought of as something like 3B and 3C, where he is um, appealing to how the scientists are using the words, rather than common sense. And I think that the best way of cashing this out is what the scientists are doing, is doing something stipulative um, to begin with. So let me just say, Stipulative, yeah. Oh, three, three B and three C. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I wrote this yesterday, so <laughs> I got the slide. I was in my lodgemon. It was like, do I turn this into a PowerPoint or do I go for lunch with Bill and Sandrine? <laughs> yeah, Bill and Sandrine beat PowerPoint. So um, I think like Adam's sort of methodology. Why I think it's something like the first type of methodology is he starts off with two classes of subjects, um, one of which claims to have conscious visual imagery, one of which doesn't. And so this initial division of the subjects seems to be based on something like the um, subject's own understanding of language and their own conscious phenomenology. And then he does a bunch of experiments, both behavioral and imaging experiments. And, there are, and then he finds there are behavioral differences and differences in neurological activity that in some sense backs up this original division and the real division. And then we might, if we carry on doing this, we might say visual imagery involves or is activity in this bit of the brain. 
Well, I think that would be a kind of substantial scientific um, identity statement, like water is H2O. Now, if we go down a bit, I've got one question. So, in his 2018 paper, Benze appeals to Adam's work for the existence of unconscious um, mental imagery. And I think sometimes when Adam talks about blind imagination, it looks like he's committed to um, unconscious imagery. But I take it the results of the behavioral experiment about rotation, it turns out that the, the a fantastic people are able to solve the task. It turns out, though, that the way they do it seems to not involve imagery. Because for normal subjects, the time it takes related to the degree of rotation is linear. So the more it's rotated, the longer it takes. So there's a linear re relationship. In the case of the a fantastic patient, it wasn't linear. And so here we get the idea that the hypothesis that this subject achieves this task by the use of unconscious mental imagery seems to be kind of ruled out. And we have the suggestion that the subject is solving this problem not by using unconscious mental imagery. So I'm wondering if Adam thinks he's got any other results that would, would in some sense strongly back the existence of unconscious mental imagery. Has he done any other behavioral studies that might support the hypothesis of unconscious mental imagery? So that's talking about the Adam stuff. I think for Bense, I suggested that his methodology is best thought of as involving an appeal to usage within the scientific community. And maybe the, oh, maybe the scientists themselves, what they're really doing is starting off with a stipulative definition. Um, and, and I think this is a good way of thinking what's going on. Um, Betsy himself, though, in, in a, oh, I think it's a 2018 paper, says that the psychological neuroscientific concept of mental imagery is an extension of the introspective philosophical concept of mental imagery. And I'm wondering if he really wants to be committed to that, how is the extension supposed to work? I'm suggesting that maybe you'll be better off just saying we're starting stipulative. I'm just giving you a stipulative definition. I don't really care about this philosophical stuff to begin with. If we start with this stipulative definition, we can, we can end up doing science because we can say here's a stipulative definition. And then it turns out we may discover scientifically that whenever there's conscious visual, visual imagery, there is visual imagery as we've so stipulated. So you can start off the stipulation, but then end up doing, having some sort of identity claim or partial identity claim at the end of it. So, yeah, so I'm wondering, do you really want to commit yourself to this being an extension of the introspective philosophical concept? Yeah, so that's quite a bit. Okay.